I'm privileged to chair this webinar today. The webinar is hosted by the GHI Post-Harvest Losses Working Group. These groups uh, have an overall mission to identify uh, technologies and procedures uh, to reduce the food loss and food waste around the globe and to identify those technologies and procedures that are appropriate uh, to be proposed for harmonized regulations. This webinar will be focused on practical and workable systems and strategies for reducing uh, post-harvest uh, food losses and wastages. And uh, this is a very important issue as uh, global food production has reached a record high in recent years. However, one third of all food produced uh, for human consumption is lost or wasted, equivalent to 1.3 billion tons. Post-harvest uh, food loss is the leading cause of food insecurity for millions of families around the world. These food losses remain very high in developing countries, estimated at about 50% uh, on average for perishable produce. Achieving zero hunger by 2030 will require that no more food is lost or wasted. By preventing post-harvest losses in food system, we can increase the availability of food worldwide without requiring additional resources or placing additional burden on the environment. All of these uh, um, topics will be discussed in today's webinar. Let me now welcome and present our special speakers today. Dr. Charles Award. He is a board director of the Global Harmonization Initiative and a retired George uh, Comantaros uh, distinguished professor from the Department of Food Technology at University of Ibadan, Nigeria. We also have with us uh, Dr. Alistair Hicks. He is an elected life fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology, for which uh, he was a counselor of the Academy Executive Committee. And also with us uh, today, we have uh, Dr. Kenneth Marsh. He is the chair of the GHI Post Harvest Losses Working Group and executive director of the Woodstock Institute for Science and Humanities in Clemson, South Carolina, in the United States a non-for-profit organization working to reduce world hunger by cutting food losses. Before we start, I would like to remind you about uh, putting your abstract for the upcoming uh, Global Harmonization Initiative World Congress on Global Food Safety and Security, exploring the team stepping up the transition of the global food system for a sustainable future. The Congress is going to be held next March, uh, 18 to 20th of March in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, you can put your abstract uh, in our dedicated GHI Congress website, www.ghiworldcongress.org. Uh, this is going to be displayed in a chat in a minute, so you'll have it there also. Hurry up as presentation spot started to fill in. So uh, if you would like to secure your presentation and if you'd like we to see you as part of our speakers list or as part of our audience during the GHI Congress, uh, please uh, start uh, creating your presentation. Uh, this is all I wanted to share at this stage about the upcoming Congress. Also, I would like to offer uh, my huge thanks to ICC for providing this platform for our webinar. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gerhard uh, Schleining and Dr. Nicholas Stanley, our GHI Communication uh, Director, for uh, their constant and exceptional work uh, putting all the webinar pieces together. Uh, thank you for all of you joining us today as part of our valuable audience. Uh, please ask as many questions as possible and challenge our speakers today. I would like to welcome our first speaker today, Dr. Charles Award. Uh, he's a board director of the Global Harmonization Initiative and a retired uh, George uh, Comentaros uh, distinguished professor from the Department of Food Technology at University of Abadan, Nigeria. He'll be talking about reducing post-harvest losses in fresh produce in developing uh, tropical countries with special reference to sub-Saharan Africa. Welcome, uh, Charles, and over to you. 
I think I apologize for the technical difficulties. Hopefully, we are going to sort them out. Uh, this is for our audience. Maybe we, we switch to the second speaker because yeah. then maybe the connection may improve. Yeah, Charles, any... could you please uh, could you please exit uh, the presentation mode? Good, and you yeah, I'll make your second speaker. Sorry about this, but uh, with the technical difficulties we can't proceed. So our next speaker is Dr. Alistair Hicks. Uh, he is an elected life fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology, for which uh, he was counselor of the Academy Executive Committee. He will be engaging us uh, with his uh, talk about enterprise skills development in village level food processing for food security and accessibility for all. Over to you, Alistair. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, if you can put this on presentation, uh, presentation oh, fantastic, good. Thank you. Okay? And uh, just like to thank very much to GHI and ICC, of course, to Dr. Gerhardt, Diana as well, Nicola, for inviting me as a panelist for this webinar with two very distinguished colleagues, Professor Charles Awar and uh, Professor Ken Marsh on practical and workable systems and strategies for reducing post-harvest food losses and wastage, a very challenging subject, I must say. This talk is on a poverty reduction and empowerment of vulnerable groups through enterprise skills development in village-level food processing. If we call it a short name, we can say Passion for Food Processing in Asia Pacific. And uh, it was not done by myself only, but with my dream Dream Dean Team, who are here below. Dr. Narin Tongsuri from Thailand, is Dean of uh, Agro-Industry of Chiang Mai University. Dr. Chirawan Chaisuan of Chiang Mai University. She's an expert in business uh, management. Dr. Yawalai Kluat Maat from the Far Eastern University, Thailand. She's an expert in marketing. And Dr. Lakana Rujanak Krakan from Mefa Luam University in Thailand, expert in food processing. Dor Win Win Chi from ADB Agribusiness, and president of FOSTAM, the Food Science and Technology Association of Myanmar. And Dr. Man Malcolm Hazelman, FAO Extension Education and Research and Development expert from Samoa. So we had a regional team, uh, internationals, training a national team. Now, the background to this is that up to 80% of the population in CLMV countries is rural. CLMV is the Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. But there is a rapidly growing young labor force, and up to 70% of that labor force have agriculture as their primary livelihood. There's a high number of vulnerable women, infants, disabled persons, returned soldiers, even monks, and up to 40% of these exist below the poverty line in some countries. The background is that agriculture is a most important livelihood in CLMV countries. And it provides employment opportunities, even though limited, in rural areas. <laughs> Unemployment is, of course, high in, in the urban areas for urban youth. In justification for food processing, it's an income generating activity for rural women and compatible with their role in enabling agricultural produce harvesting, enhancing lifestyles, education and skills, increasing livelihoods at home and village level, reducing their need to migrate to cities, and improving marketability of processed food products. So the justification is that up to 70% of female agricultural and fishery workers have another job, which is, for example, hand -to graph production, food processing, small trading business. And these secondary incomes are essential for them to raise money for their school kids and for their families. Now, traditional food processing uses simple technologies for home products for sale at local markets, for example, sun-dried fruits, meats, and seafood, with inconsistent quality, little or no packaging, short shelf life, poor hygiene, as you can see in, in the picture. Now, without any 
discrimination, I'm, I'm going to say here that traditional food processing is very much women's work and a natural extension of women's traditional role in food preparation and represents 75% of people engaged in food processing as their primary occupation. Or as the Minister for Women's Affairs in Cambodia says, food is women's business, we do it better. So traditional food processing, however, has many constraints. There are serious issues existing in hygiene, food safety, shelf life, packaging and environment. And all of those elements are shown in the picture here. And you can see that that's quite a challenge to produce mm. hygienic food in that situation. Traditional food processing is often done in unclean markets. And you can see here that women have to process market food products often in very poor hygienic conditions. For example, uh, food pickles, prahok. Prahok is Cambodian fish sauce. Uh, palm sugar, fresh fish is a fire hazard and a health hazard. You can see in the photo here that the woman is working with an open fire underneath this huge wok. And above her is a canvas saturated with oil, ready to go up in flames at any time. The hygiene issue is, uh, for example, my own feet. I do apologize. I'm standing on the area where they're going to put the fresh fish. So I had to make a lot of apologies and clean the floor before that was done. But you can see that the issues are there and very real. Now, in, in traditional food processing, clean food simply cannot be made in unhygienic locations. And I think you can see very well that this, these sort of locations harbor rodents and all other sort of organisms which will contaminate the food products. Village food processing is still a very sound option. It strengthens village-based enterprises by building on existing resources and skills in villages, increasing productivity at the household level, empowering women, giving livelihood alternatives to women and vulnerable groups, adds value to agricultural crops, and making food for home consumption and sale at local markets. Thus reducing poverty in rural areas. The village food processing has great potential as it contributes to food security and reduces food losses at the household level by responding to domestic market needs as 95% of the products are otherwise imported from other regions, other parts of the country, or even from next door countries or overseas. By promoting local products and cuisine in the tourism industry, we focused on that in this project, what products could be available to, to tourists visiting the country, and meeting overseas Cambodian demands, in this case, in the market. These are Cambodian products in these bottles. Now, the village food processing has got constraints through limited technical inputs and no capital for research and development, very few facilities for testing food products, very poor market channels, no facilities for packaging, reliance on fuel woods, inability to compete with imports. And you can see a, a wide range of products in this screen, some of which are packaged hygienically and carefully, some of which are labeled, unlabeled, all sorts of combinations. And all of these can be upgraded and village food processing is a huge industry. You may think that multinational companies are large, but I would, I would challenge you with the question that village level food processing is perhaps the largest food industry in the world because it's global, it's important, and street foods and village foods are feeding people all around the world, millions of people. Brilliant. So village food processing needs supportive policies, especially better techniques of preserving foods, freezing, drying foods, packaging and present presentation foods, for market development and promotion, for improved business management, for product development and for process development. All of this needs supportive policies, and these are from the government departments in association with these village level food processes. And we are help the helping project address these policy needs. 
Our national food training centers need well-designed and hygienic buildings for food processing and packaging, and low-cost equipment used to preserve foods. We're demonstrating here uh, the solar dryers which were built for this project, and we're talking about a cost of three to five hundred dollars worth of, of uh, value in these solar dryers, which is manageable in small-scale businesses. Let's show another slide of that. And you can see from the vertical viewpoint, the, the solar collector collecting hot air, bringing it up vertically up through the dryer and out through the ventilation, uh, through the top of that uh, solar dryer and drying the food products by natural vent hot air ventilation without using any uh, un unacceptable uh, form of energy except the solar energy. The, uh, the solar dryer has been converted over here and it was designed by Dr. Narin, Narin Tongsuri. And we now call it the Royal Solar Dryer because it has a crown on top of a ventilator which works automatically with hot air to circulate and remove the air more quickly from the dryer. The, uh, the construction is, is from aluminum frames which are used for making windows in all sorts of countries. Uh, together with ultraviolet resistant plastic, and stainless steel shelves to, to maintain the product in a clean, hygienic condition while they're being dried. So this was found to be very successful in all the countries and has gone much further in South Pacific countries as well uh, as a very reliable way of drying food in a clean, hygienic way, keeping the flies off it, and keep, keeping the molds and contamination from taking place. Now, the National Food Training Center uh, has to enable food products to be marketed. So we introduced a, a, a marketing vehicle. It's, got, it's a wheeled vehicle, which, is, which was uh, unknown in Cambodia at the time. Now there are thousands of them there. We imported it from Thailand. And uh, this was actually on the coronation of the, the new king in, in Cambodia. Uh, and people were buying products to celebrate. So we sold out everything in about half an hour, and uh, we certainly got good experience in marketing on the streets uh, with this particular form of uh, sale. Now, the other, the other thing that is needed uh, and, and is done in the National Food Training Center is marketing training. And so we held many market exhibitions held for potential donors and business contacts. So we present the food products over here with the team behind. And donors and industry people would come and discuss the products and see whether there's any potential for a business. Uh, and a street stall in Phnom Penh gave the trainees real life experience of food marketing. And this was also found to be very successful. The National Food Training Center marketing training was applied also to packaged food products. For example, here, banana chips, which are packaged and placed in supermarkets uh, with their permission, giving trainees outlets for their food products and hopefully satisfied customers in the market. Now, this is a, a shot of the food processing center where the teams of trainees are learning about food processing under Dr. Lacanau. And as you can see, they are dressed hygienically with the nice white uniforms and, uh, and hair, hair covered with, uh, of course, face masks. And of course, with uh, clean surfaces, stainless steel equipment where possible, and uh, learning, and with gloves, of course, to handle food products. And you can see a sample here of, for example, mango leather that's been produced by th these teams. So, this training was done over a period of about two weeks. And these women trainees were practiced in hygienic food processing to make clean, village level food products. And here, here was the first team that graduated after a couple of weeks of this workshop and went out to train other people in food processing. So it gave opportunities to trainees at this National Food Training Center, Kampong Spur in Cambodia. Now the agribusiness exhibitions was important for the ministries involved. There are several ministries in most countries involved in food and agriculture. Of course, Ministry of Agriculture uh, Ministry of Industry, the Ministry of Finance, of course, and in Cambodia, 
the, the Ministry of Women's Affairs was also particularly involved. And at the same time, we wanted to attract private sector companies to come and to examine the products and take up a business, perhaps engage the team that had made these products and start a business. So it was a very uh, quick way of getting connections and getting people into business. So the agribusiness training was providing a mini market for business people and donors of food products made by the trainees. And here they are consulting and discussing with the trainees about the products. And here in the second photo is a team of international, regional and national trainers to teach agribusiness at the village level. So this is the, the international team who then trained the national team. Uh, and then, of course, the national team would train the trainees in their own language. This language was an issue, obviously, for the international team. So we had to have uh, national trainers who could speak English and also a local language. And then they went on to train the trainees. And so that was the way that it could expand. The socioeconomics part of the training was learned through group interactions and practice with the trainers, as you can see here. And the socioeconomics training enabled successful entrepreneurs and group leaders to be identified, recognized and encouraged by the trainers. Now, this is a key part of the, the, the training, was the issuing of starting kits for the trainees by the ministry, in this case, the Ministry of Women's Affairs. This lady in the center is the minister, or was the minister of women's affairs at that time for that project. And she's issuing these training kits worth about between 50 and $100 and to the trainees who are all dressed up and ready to, to receive their, their training kits. Now, there were, two, there were two approaches. One is that they would perhaps pay off the training kit over a year, say uh, $1 a week, for 50 weeks, or they they were required to train 10 other people, in which case they would get the kit free. Of course, most of them chose the training, and it would normally be their own family and extended members of the family or their neighbors. And so we got a very rapid expansion of this training uh, by this method. Now, at the village level itself, these trainees went then to the villages themselves and started to train villagers and under that program of uh, purchasing their starting kit. So this was the way it expanded. And uh, this is the way we could re reach the, the village level by trainers who had been just trained themselves. And here we are in village level situations, doing our best to produce food products with the very simple apparatus that they have in the village level. And this provides income from village food products. And there, there were success cases in each of the countries where this gentleman was producing his product and uh, enabling him to support his family and send his kids to school with his family working together with him. So there were some men involved in the process as well, but it's essentially was women who were leading the way. Now the economic empowerment and entrepreneurship and employment for women can be demonstrated with this mind map showing the skills in, and human resource development, market oriented skills training, and mobile training unit, the micro enterprise development with business skills training, facilitating linkages to markets, common facility units, and formation of associations, access to microcredit, facilitating linkages to uh, microfinance institutes and facilitating savings and credit groups, and socio-cultural empowerment by women-friendly environments with life skills training, functional literacy, and personal and business counseling and support. So in conclusion, what we have found is that in CLMB countries, women are passionate about village-level food processing. And I thank you for your kind attention. Welcome. Any questions? At this point. Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, so, in many, uh, there are many questions, uh, and uh, for uh, our 
and also for Dr. Charles as well. Uh, uh, we are going to hear his presentation in a second. But uh, now a quick question for you. In many Southeast Asian countries, uh, mm -hmm. you presented uh, uh, more about Cambodia, but uh, uh, for example, Vietnam, uh, food are processed on the ground uh, uh, in exactly the same way that uh, um, you presented in your earlier photographs uh, uh, of the fish processing. Yes. So this was processing is uh, a part of uh, the traditional way of producing food in these villages and these places. I saw it myself uh, um, uh, when I was visiting Hanoi. This was on yes. the street, processing yes. on the ground. Yes. So uh, if it's related to tradition, what can be done to improve the food processing way? I, I think that uh, it's a very important question. And I think that uh, hygiene was the basic issue and of course, uh, microorganisms are invisible. So we had to have a program of what we called seeing is believing. And so mm. we, would, uh, we would arrange for people to perhaps uh, put their fingerprints on an agar plate in the first day of the workshop. And three days later, they were quite shocked uh, at how many, how many uh, organisms were growing on that agar plate from their fingers, which they had no idea, or even a hair from their head no idea that those microorganisms were available until they could actually see it themselves. And I, I think they, they are very conscious of, of hygiene, but they're just unable without uh, finance really to do better than they can, mm. as you could see in the village. But in, in Vietnam, they have what they call occupational community villages, so that the village, the whole village itself, takes on a program of producing the food products. So for example, rice paper. Uh, and uh, that's done in the whole village uh, where the rice is made into paper and dried in the sun and, and packaged yeah. and marketed. And that then becomes a, a very important to them that the shelf life and the safety and the, you know, the, the uniform appearance of the, food, of the product they're making is uniform. So that they do have a, 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 an awareness, of course, of, of the need for these, these things. And it was just a matter of uh, them organizing themselves to, to point in that direction that we will make better products. And they, they do, and, and they, they last longer in the market, they make more money, and they, there are less food losses, which is the, the bottom line, I guess, for this whole discussion. Yeah. I hope that there are many, Yeah, there are many food losses uh, also in uh, uh, also Asia Pacific countries, um, for example, yes. uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, yes. where they don't have electricity. So uh, this is a question uh, from our audience. As how can households extend shelf life of their produce in areas where there is no electricity? Yes, that's also a very important question. And there are only certain technologies which can, which can really be used without electricity. And of course, solar energy is, is the primary one. And nowadays, of course, uh, uh, wind energy and so on are being uh, being developed in these countries but at that time the drying operation was the key either that or fermentation uh, which was another way of, of preserving the product without electricity but by using a microorganisms to ferment the product such that it became preserved preserving itself in its own uh, solution uh, or and, salting and were, uh, or salting of course and, and so on so there are a limited number of, of as you say non-energy uh, products but yes the the the, uh, the issues in the island countries is, is great but they're they're working very much towards uh, renewable energy and i think the food industry will will take hold as that energy becomes available uh, for further other products for example uh, i talked about freezing which was a bit perhaps a, a unnecessary in the sense that um, it's only available to people with electricity where you've got this, these dried products, again, they need, they need packaging to remain dried and not become contaminated with molds and so on. So there, there are all sorts of issues, but they're, they're dealing with it and they, it, the, the seeing is believing it was a good start. Yeah. Okay, uh, stay with us uh, because uh, there'll be more questions for you at the end. Uh, so um, I'm going back to Dr. Charles Award. Uh, which uh, had earlier technical difficulties. 
I hope uh, now the connection will be stable. Uh, so Charles Awop is a board director of the Global Harmonization Initiatives and the retired George uh, Kumantaros, distinguished professor from the Department of Food Technology at University of Ibadan, Nigeria. He will be talking about reducing post-harvest losses in fresh produce in developing uh, tropical countries with special reference to Sub-Saharan Africa. Over to you, Charles, and I hope uh, the connection will be stable this time. Okay, here we go. I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, please. Thank you. Well, I listened carefully to my brother and friend Ali's presentation, and I learned quite a bit from it. Um, again, I joined him in thanking the Global Harmonization Initiative for this privilege to share on this uh, very, very important issue of um, high post harvest losses, village level processing, and the likes in um, developing countries. I will focus my presentation on reducing post harvest losses in fresh produce in developing tropical countries with special reference to sub Saharan Africa. Um, I want to start by trying to make the point that uh, indeed uh, we should make the distinction between food loss and food waste. Um, post harvest losses in fresh produce in developing countries occur early in the supply chain and are primarily a consequence of poor agricultural practices and weak supply chain. Whereas food waste in developed countries occur at the end of the food supply chain, largely at the retail and consumer levels, and it's primarily a, cons a consequence of consumer behavior. In developing countries, the issue is the damage done to badly needed foods that never get to the retail level or the consumer, thus aggravating food insecurity. In developed countries, the issue is the discarding of wholesome foods that are downgraded or are not just needed, but could contribute to global food security. Now, some 50 years ago, the United Nations General Assembly in New York on 19 September 1975 passed a resolution we state inter alia that, and I quote, the further reduction of post harvest losses in developing countries should be undertaken as a matter of pri priority with a view to reaching at least 50% reduction in 1985. Clearly, that was not achieved in many developing countries. Some progress was made, but that was not uh, achieved. Today, post-harvest losses in fresh produce in developing countries, where small resource poor farmers account for the bulk of food production, remains unacceptably high, estimated at about 50% on the average, but could be much higher depending on the circumstances, as they are often time dependent and location specific. But the main focus of my presentation has to do with, again, here we are. I just want to highlight some of the things that we already know, the consequences of high post-harvest food losses in developing countries. Um, of course, it is a major cause of food insecurity. It discourages food production because farmers will not produce unless they have returns. 
It leads to unstable food supply and seasonal food shortages. It reduces farm income and uh, impoverish farmers, so farmers do not get return for their labors. It endangers rural livelihoods. It aggravates poverty. It constrains rural development, and it promotes rural urban migration and the associated social disruptions as people move from the rural areas to the urban areas. Now, the factors promoting post-harvest losses, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is of course our tropical environment, that is the high temperature and humidity, the high incidence of pests and diseases, infrastructural deficits, such as lack of good roads, railways, water transport, electricity, portable water, all those things that are taken for granted in developed countries are not just available in our part of the world. Of course, we have poor agricultural practices, and I'll spend some time on this, poor harvesting practices, poor post-harvest handling practices, poor market facilities, poor sanitation and hygiene, and lack of regulation and a certification system. Again, we, have, we don't have regulations re relating to food safety and such things. And where they are available, there is not really the will to enforce them. Now, the other issues have to deal specifically with what are the factors that make fresh fruits and vegetables particularly susceptible to high post-harvest losses. Fresh fruits and vegetables are particularly susceptible to biological, physiological, and physical or mechanical damage on account of their high moisture content. They generally range from 70 to 95% moisture. They have high rate of metabolic activities, including high rates of respiration. There are problems with ripening and overripening senescence, sprouting in commodities like onions that reduce their post-harvest life. And they are made up of soft tissue. The most of the edible parts are made up of parenchyma cells that we know have very thin cell walls and are readily damaged. So those factors make fruits and vegetables particularly liable to high post-harvest losses. And that's why I've chosen them really for my presentation. So the rest of the presentation has to do with some of the loss, food loss reduction measures that we can take, especially those practicable, simple ones. And they include advocacy and, ad, and education. There are simple interventions requiring no additional inputs other than education that can produce dramatic results. Of course, our farmers, small farmers have to adopt good agricultural practices. They have to adopt good harvesting practices and they need to adopt good hygienic practices if they are to control microbial uh, and biological damage to their commodities. So there are, of course, other things that can be done, which I will uh, focus on as I hope to get again my slide moving. But some of this will include such things as uh, improved post-harvest handling practices and packing house operations. We don't have those at all. Um, and where we have them, they are really rudimentary. We will need to improve our transport and market conditions. We need infrastructural development, like I mentioned earlier. We will have to strengthen our supply chain, including development of cold chains. Refrigeration is indispensable 
for extending the shelf life of fresh produce. Um, also, these days, we can use digital technology to bridge information gap and improve market access for smallholder farmers, which is one big problem that they have. But in many countries, now we have uh, mobile phones, so we can leverage digital technology to improve market access. Lack of market information and access to local, regional, and international markets by resource poor smallholder farmers in developing countries increases post harvest losses in fresh fruits and vegetables due to their highly perishable nature. Africa has the fastest growing number of mobile phone users in the world. By creating efficient linkages between production and market and overcoming the constraints of access to market information, mobile phones and the internet can reduce reliance on market intermediaries and promote the inclusion of resource poor smallholder farmers that are often marginalized in national, regional, and even global markets. So what I intend to show now, moving quickly, are just slides of the simple things that we could do. For example, I've talked about advocacy and education and good agricultural practices. If our farmers can just keep their fields clean, free from weeds, as we see on the right, then they can get quality produce. Weed control is important. For example, such things as taking tomatoes and keeping the fruits from touching the soil will reduce damage by microorganisms, okay? Very often as farmers use all sorts of water, whatever they can see, at times they use sewage water or sludge for irrigation that are contaminated. When they do such things, the kind of produce, mangoes that you will get will be the type that I've shown on the left as opposed to the type on the right, which is what we want if we use good agricultural practice. So there are simple things that our farmers can actually do. Another thing will be improved harvesting practices. We should replace our poor harvesting practices, such as shaking trees, tree branches, so that the fruits fall to the ground, or hitting them with sticks with careful hand picking and the use of simple harvesting tools, using ladders and picking bags. Because once the fruits fall to the ground and are damaged, there is very little that we can do in terms of uh, extending their shelf life. So careful harvesting is really very, very key. We also we need to improve our, on our transportation, use better transport system conditions. Do not transport unpackaged produce as is done on the right with that truck that has just broken down, filled with um, bananas unpackaged. We should have them properly packaged as we see on the left. We should not just use any kind of vehicle to transport plantain as we see on the right. Such transportation damage the fruits and result in very short shelf life. So we should improve on transportation. So these are simple, simple things that we don't need any sophisticated technology to do. And those are the things that I'm stressing. We should also improve on our market conditions. I think Ali illustrated this in his uh, presentation. In Africa, in Nigeria and other places, our central wholesale markets are in deplorable conditions. They are badly located, heavily congested, badly maintained, and lack essential infrastructure like electricity and portable water, as you can see in those slides. Market operations are carried out in the open. There is lack of storage facilities. There is lack of waste disposal facilities. 
these are things that we must provide. This is a typical market in Nigeria with open display of produce. Obviously, in that kind of a situation, you are not going to have extended shelf life, and all you are going to have is high losses. So we will need to improve on our market. Now, I will just quickly, because of uh, time, packing house operations, uh, market preparatory operations that prepare fresh produce for the market and include simple things like sorting and grading, washing, especially the use of chlorination or such things as uh, hydrogen peroxide in the water to reduce the microbial load, pre-cooling, hot water treatment at times could be applicable for such things as mango and papaya. Waxing can improve appearance and then packaging, as I stressed. So these are simple things that we could do to enhance the shelf life of our produce. And all these other slides are just illustrations of the things that I'm talking about. The need for sorting and grading, how it can be done, on a small scale, not really very, very sophisticated, the need for packaging and um, the rest of it. Again, it appears to be stuck, but I think that the real key message has been sent as I again thank uh, the audience for their kind uh, attention and I will welcome uh, further questions. Uh, I'm sure Diana can share my slide with the audience later, but because it's just talk, it's not just moving. Well, you've seen chlorination, there are one or two of them, but I think um, we, can, we can just go ahead and uh, head, end this presentation at this point. Well, elements of pre-cooling are shown uh, in that slide, and I think uh, um, that's about um, that's about it. Again, I apologize the challenges that you face in this part of the world. I'm glad that I was able to make the presentation and that you could hear me. But we'll take questions. I've mentioned hot water treatment before. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, we are very glad that uh, you were able to uh, do your presentation. And um, uh, there, there are a few questions uh, that. Uh, uh, coming from our audience for you. Uh, people are uh, more concrete, uh, like interested in specific uh, produce. So what measures are required to store bananas for at least six months? This is uh, one question that uh, came from our audience. And uh, also, uh, how will food loss be reduced, especially onions and tomatoes? So if you can uh, start with this, it will be good. Thank you. Well, if we could store banana for six months in the fresh stage, that will be a major, major breakthrough. Um, with the present technology that we have, um, that unfortunately will not be possible because even with a controlled atmosphere storage, um, I think if we get up to eight weeks under refrigeration with controlled atmosphere storage, we will have done very well. Um, so um, most of our tropical produce, unfortunately, are susceptible to chilling injury. So even if you store them under refrigeration, there's a limitation that you can get in terms of extended uh, post-service life. So under refrigeration, it should be possible to hold bananas for about three weeks uh, or thereabout under refrigeration at the right temperature. And this will be like 12 or 13 degrees C. So it's really cooling, not going too low, because if we get too low, we will again create the problem of uh, uh, physiological injury. The skins would yeah. start turning brown if it is green uh, banana, you won't get proper ripening. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, that can be done. That cannot be done. But of course, we can process 
the banana into a number of uh, other products that are shelf stable. Even uh, we can have um, osmotically dried um, uh, bananas that we taste very, very well. Um, so there are other oh, simple there. things that we can do. Yes, yes. So that's that, that's a challenge. But with refrigeration, we can get to perhaps a month at, at yeah. the most under the right. So how condition. to reduce the yeah. the food loss for onions and tomatoes? For onions and tomatoes, uh, fairly simple. For onions, really straightforward. If we have the onions properly dried. Uh, after harvest, dry to remove the moisture content, to reduce the moisture content, uh, they will keep indeed uh, for several months. Once they are dried, the outer scales are dried, the onions will keep. Uh, the real problem will be with sprouting, but they will not begin to sprout until after a month or two. So for onions, really, the thing is to dry them properly and they will keep. Uh, for tomatoes, same, same challenge with uh, Bananas, several varieties are chill insensitive, but again, with tomatoes, we can get a number of good dry products. Uh, we can use uh, Ali's uh, solar dryer to get very good uh, tomato slices that are dried, that we can meal and reconstitute to make the kind of sauces that we use in Nigeria or paste for which we use tomatoes. Thank you very much, Diana. Yeah. Thank you. There'll be more questions uh, for you. Uh, so please stay with us. Uh, we'll continue with um, our next speaker, Dr. Kenneth Marsh. He's uh, the chair of the GHI Post Harvest Losses Working Group and executive director of the Woodstock Institute for Science and the Humanities in Clemson, South Carolina, in the United States a non-for-profit organization working to reduce world hunger by cutting food losses for a long time. Uh, Dr. Marsh will be talking on a very important topic of a comprehensive plan to reduce post-harvest food loss and waste. Over to you. Well, I want to say that I feel very lucky to uh, share the podium with uh, both Ali and Charles uh, for two reasons. One, they have tremendous expertise, and two, they've already covered part of my presentation. So it makes it a lot easier for me. Um, uh, first slide, please. And if we talk about post-harvest losses, we talked about lo loss and waste, which Charles has already covered. So uh, going to the second slide, there are many different types of damage that we get from the post-harvest losses. They can include the uh, technical, which is the biological, the chemical, and the physical. Uh, as mentioned here. There's a cultural uh, problem as well. When you go into um, developing countries and uh, try look uh, presenting different types of technology, you can very often get a situation where it was good enough for my grandfather, it's good enough for me, and there's a resistance to change. And that's a problem that's above and beyond the technical side. Uh, the waste was already mentioned, and then the political difficulties are multiple, uh, and the global harmonization addresses some of them. The uh, regulations uh, that are based on size, shape, origin, and things like that, that are, have nothing to do with food safety, will cause losses that have nothing to do with safety. So they're uh, losses. Uh, you also have trade barriers. Uh, sometimes they're veiled, sometimes not. Um, I believe that uh, the opposition to genetically modified organisms very often is based on a trade barrier against the United States and not on the technical aspects of the GMOs. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of expediency, um, expediencies where people on the political side are going to do what's good for them right now, but not necessarily what's good for the future. Next slide, please. The FAO findings per capita, and Charles has already mentioned this, but here are the numbers. Uh, in the developing countries, the production is about 460 kilograms per year, and the loss is limited uh, on the basis of infrastructure, as Charles has already mentioned, and here are the numbers. In the, developing, in the developed countries, the production is higher, uh, but the losses are higher mostly because of discarding, in, in other words, food waste. But interestingly enough, the overall proportion is approximately a third of production overall. 
Now that does not need specific products. Some products are in the 90s, some of them are so in the 50s. So the losses vary, but uh, overall it's about a third of total production. Next slide, please. So the agricultural production is sufficient to offer 2,800 calories per day per person, and which is more than we need. Uh, so production is actually adequate to re remove hunger completely. The problems are we have an uneven production and distribution. Uh, for example, the United States is available 3,500 calories per day, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, it averages about 2,300. But uh, the food is lost, next slide which leads to uneven distribution. And I think it is tragic that this slide is at all possible. Uh, but unfortunately, these are images that are real people and uh, it exists. Next slide, please. The environmental impact of one third food losses is tremendous. Uh, with 1.3 billion tons of food lost every year, if that was, if the greenhouse gases produced by making that much food was a country, it would be the third largest country in the world, second only to the United States and China. The amount of water that would be used is about 250 cub, uh, cub, cl, uh, cubic kilometers, which is equivalent to the annual discharge of the Volga River or equivalent to about three times the volume of Lake Geneva in Switzerland. The land use is a 1.4 billion hectares, which is tremendous, uh, and we really can't afford that. Next slide, please. So how much do we need? Uh, the fact that hungry people are living means that they are getting some food. If they were getting none, they would not survive. So the uh, these are strictly estimates. Um, swag means scientific wild ass guess, but uh, I, I'm assuming that we need about 2,000 calories per day, which is what the labels often are based on uh, when they do nutritional content of food. Uh, it's based on 2,000 calories per day, which is enough to keep people alive, not necessarily keep them well. Food insecure, I'm estimating, get about 1,200 calories per day. So this means that we need about 210 um, billion kilograms which turns out to be about 16.2% of those losses of 1.3 billion tons. So uh, that is a reasonable amount of recovery. And uh, the developed countries and the less developed countries have the technologies to do more than that. Next slide, please. So we could feed the world if we recover about 16.5% of the food that is now lost. And I claim that we already know how. Uh, I presented this at a World Food Congress and I said we know how. But what does that mean? If we, next slide please. If we go to the hunger map that is produced by the Food Agricultural Organization, we can take a look at the distribution of hunger around the world. And you can see that the red areas are places where hunger is higher. The green areas are where hunger is less. And I would like you to just try and remember this map because I'm going to refer to it in a couple more slides. Um, but this shows where there is more hunger. So next slide. If we cut the food losses and include, uh, increase global food security, there are many resources that we already have. There are food experts around the globe. Uh, there are food organizations in many countries and they mostly join an organization called the International Union of Food Science and Technology. And all three of us uh, speakers happen to be uh, fellows of the academy that's associated with that institute. There are, that is a cooperative institute of food organizations in countries all around the world. The World Packaging Organization is a composite of packaging experts from around the globe, members of food of packaging organizations in multiple countries. They're also concerned experts. There are many um, professors in academia that are interested in helping. And since sufficient food is produced and the technologies exist in developed countries and less developed countries, the challenge is to 
find those technologies that are appropriate to transfer between countries and um, add regulations, getting back to GHI, uh, less waste in the, uh, in the developed countries and things along those lines. Next slide. So I've worked on a comprehensive plan to reduce food losses with the international cooperation. Uh, also look at infrastructure investment, which was already discussed a, a couple of times by Charles and for which I have an idea that might help get that justification. The harmonized food regulations we already mentioned with the Global Harmonization Initiative, which is sponsoring the seminar. And uh, we need to build political will and we have to reduce food waste. Next slide. Now, this is the slide that I said I was going to be talking about. The areas in green are countries that have food institutes with food experts that are members of these institutes that have already been willing to share their expertise. The countries in red are countries that have packaging institutes. The countries in brown are countries that have both. Now, what I wanted to show is that experts in food and packaging exist in these countries that are colored. And the countries that are not colored, now this is an older chart, so there has been some changes in the last few years, but the countries that are not colored don't have formal institutes that we could go to to ask if experts will volunteer to help with technology transfer. So the experts exist around the globe, but they are concentrated more in the countries that are colored. So how do we use these experts? I like to call this group of experts a knowledge resource center. Next slide. We know about food techniques that have been published and that have been presented in international seminars. I'm not talking about we, I'm talking about we in the developed world more, um, that uh, the uh, developed countries have a tendency to think that what we develop is available and what other people develop is not that important, which I think is hogwash. Uh, I have seen many techniques for reducing food losses around the globe. And unfortunately, we know about the ones that are published and we know about the ones that are presented in languages that we understand. We don't know about those that are not presented in the literature and not presented in international conferences. And people from less developed nations don't necessarily have the budgets to go to conferences. And... Uh, they concentrate on their own country because the losses are severe and they can't afford to have them. So there are many technologies. Now, I want to separate the idea of high technology versus appropriate technology. Uh, Alistair showed uh, solar furnaces that were appropriate technology. They were not brand new. They were technologies that use solar and they were very, very smart, very effective but they were building on technologies that have existed for centuries, uh, just done in a new way and a better way. But uh, they are not, shall I say, sexy technologies that we like to see in the scientific literature, but they are very effective for cutting food losses. So if we could figure out a way to transfer these technologies more effectively, that would be a boon. Next slide. Multiple paths to save food. We have the regulatory form on the top. We have cutting food waste with, um, uh, and food waste, which I will talk about shortly. We have the infrastructure development that Charles has already mentioned. We have the economic development with village food processing that Ali discussed. Um, we have building political will, which is the one thing that has nothing to do with technology. And unfortunately, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of skills in that area. And uh, that's something that needs to be addressed by better experts than myself. Uh, education about diet, uh, which relates to our choice of food to both keep healthy and use foods that require less resources. And the cutting the food waste, which I'm going to discuss right now. Next slide, please. So, we can identify and evaluate institutes and technologies around the globe, 
as I mentioned with that, what I'm calling the Knowledge Resource Center, and identify regions where technologies will work. Uh, the um, technologies that Ali presented in uh, Southeast Asia are applicable in other places. I saw a, ra a rice technology in Sri Lanka that required a drape that cut the loss of moisture, that prevented moisture gain of rice seeds and improved the storage capabilities of those rice seeds from 30% viability in three months to 90% viability in a year. That technology was developed in Sri Lanka and published in Singalese and would be equally useful in Vietnam, which is third in rice production, and China and many other countries. So uh, that is a technology that could be transferred. Well, how do we transfer it? We promote the exchange. Alistair taught me that uh, oftentimes it's worthwhile concentrating on small businesses owned by women to help with that technology transfer because they're interested, very interested in new technologies or appropriate technologies. So we can tap on the IUFOST, the World Packaging Organization and volunteer experts. And what I propose is that these experts who volunteer to help will give information for free for knowledge that is direct knowledge. So somebody contacts one of these professors and said, I was looking for uh, what temperature should I chill my bananas, as uh, Charles mentioned, what temperature should I chill my bananas, which will increase the shelf life, but not result in chill injury? Useful question. And the, t the professors will say, okay, here is the answer. And they will respond to emails, letters, phone calls, whatever, and give that information for free. Now, there are some times where you have to adapt that technology and that requires some consulting. Well, I propose that that consulting could be paid consulting and it would be paid for by the country that needs the technology and well worth it from the expertise that the professor has to offer. Now, there are some times where you have a problem that is much more difficult than that and a solution does not currently exist. And what I propose is that the country that needs that technology offer a grant for a one of their best graduate students to go and study in that university under that professor and the country in question will offer a grant to pay for that graduate work now sometimes students come back and implement that technology and sometimes they go on to other episodes so the proposal is that the contract be written that the graduate study was a grant if the student returns and it was a loan if not. So if the student decides to go elsewhere for employment, um, he or she has to pay back that loan. And the fourth part of this is that uh, we have to publish and present uh, information to spread the world, or uh, spread this word. Next slide, please. So in a, uh, a graphic, what I'm talking about is you have post harvest institutes in different countries and you have food and packaging experts and they just promote technology transfer uh, between and around with different organizations. Next slide. So getting back to what Charles said about infrastructure, the uh, if you have uh, trucks uh, carrying fresh produce around, let's say we have bags of fresh produce rather than cases or crates and you have these bags in the back of a truck and you go over potholes and what you end up getting is pulp and juice at the bottom of the truck. So the lack of good infrastructure, as Charles mentioned, promotes more damage. Um, if I talk about roads and ocean transport, if we are shipping products from say central Kansas in the United States to sub-Saharan Africa. In, uh, uh, so we have to go through the United States, ocean transport to Africa, and then through Africa. One third of the cost could be bringing it to the coast of Africa and two thirds of the cost to bring it into the interior of Africa. The reason being is that the infrastructure 
is more difficult going through Africa. So there is a program that the World Bank uses. It's called Highway Development and Management Program, HDM4. And this is used to economically justify whether or not they can afford to build roads. It's infrastructure development program. And it's based on how many axles will break and what's the cost if they don't build that road. Well, unfortunately, that program does not include food losses as one of those costs that could be abated by the road construction. And I contend that if they added food loss into that calculation, they could justify more roads and uh, help with that same problem that Charles talked about. Next slide, please. We get to village level processing where food waste is converted into value added products. And this was discussed very well by Ali. So I don't have to go into, uh, into that discussion, but there are also packaging analogs to what he was talking about with food processing. Uh, in the United States, uh, Ball Corporation, which makes uh, canning jars, used to have a truck that went around from community to community and showed people how to can produce and uh, and save it longer. Well, Multivac and Bosch, which are two companies that make food processing equipment for the industry, had trucks that did the same thing in Africa, where they would go from community to community and show how you can preserve food products and uh, and do it with packaging, which is the basis for a lot of any processing you do for any food will last a limited amount of time if you don't package that product to protect that processing and prevent it from being contaminated. Next slide, please. We get to the Global Harmonization Initiative. The basic idea is to build a common set of regulations based on science that address safety and not anything else other than safety. So we don't exclude foods because of size, shape, color, blemish, anything like that. And um, but I'd like to get to another point that is not typically covered is that there are contamination issues that are directly related to safety and contamination issues will include microorganisms that make you sick, like salmonella or microorganisms that can be fatal, like Clostridium botulinum. And it also includes things like insect parts that we don't want to have in our food or um, uh, or pesticides or things along those lines. And what I contend is that the we need to have a risk benefit analysis for these components. So if you're trying to exclude Clostridium botulinum out of food, which can be fatal, you have to exclude it completely. And a lot of the processing procedures and techniques and standards are based on killing Clostridium botulinum. So that's excluded from the food. You also want to exclude Salmonella, same reason. But if you have insect parts, we don't want insect parts in our food. But the truth of the matter is that any large scale farm production is going to include insect parts in food. So if I say I want zero insect parts, I'm basically saying that we can destroy all of the food that is produced. Obviously, that doesn't work. Well, what I am proposing is that we consider starvation as a food hazard so that when the government organizations are setting the standards, they include starvation as a possible hazard and then do a risk benefit to see where it is reasonable. So we develop regulations to promote and not restrict food. Next slide, please. I said on the other slide, building political will. Well, quoting Shakespeare, that is the rub. Uh, I don't have any control of that, and I don't know many scientists that do, but uh, the political will is essential and very difficult to get. Uh, but that is not uh, within the realm of scientists. Next slide, please. Getting to waste quickly, this is more of a problem in the developed countries than the developing countries, but we have tremendous amounts of waste. Uh, I was visiting a um, supermarket in Germany uh, a couple of minutes before closing, 
and they were going around and picking up all of the bakery items and throwing them into garbage cans so they could discard them because they had to have every variety of bread at closing and sufficient quantities that anybody who came in in those last five minutes had it, which meant that if they didn't sell it, they threw it out. Fruits and vegetables that get slightly blemished, things along those lines. The hospitality industry of hotels, um, restaurants, things along those lines, waste a tremendous amount of food. In the United States, a lot of companies are supersizing the meals. So you have restaurants that are giving portions that are larger than people can eat, and a lot of food gets wasted. I like the model of satiety, not gluttony. And my favorite restaurant is in Switzerland that um, serves a reasonable portion and a salad, and they have a wine list and great things like that. But they have a steak and fries, and they give you a small portion of fries right out of the fryer that are delicious. And when you finish that portion, you can get another. And when you finish that portion, you can get another. You can get as many portions as you want, but you always get a small portion right out of the fryer. They have no waste or virtually no waste. Uh, I would like to see restaurants serve more reasonable portions and allow you to have seconds if you so wish so that people with a big appetite eat more and the people with less of an appetite don't have to eat more. Um, with waste, can we re recycle nutrients? We, can we irradiate foods? Irradiation is a procedure where you can sterilize foods. It's expensive, but you can have regional radiators that take food, what would be normally waste, and convert it into either human food, if it's appropriate, animal food, if appropriate, and if not, nutrients for the soil. Can we make waste unacceptable? Uh, by the way, with the uh, recycling nutrients in uh, France, there are, uh, in all France, there have garbage cans in the town square where restaurants bring their waste so that they can be composted. So those nutrients are collected. They do not go into the landfill. Now, getting to the consumer level, education, portrait size, both um, um, when you sell things in the supermarket, you want to buy appropriate portions. If you get if it's cheaper when you buy a large quantity and you don't eat that quantity, it's wasting food. Now, pay as you throw is the last item, and next slide describes that. What pay as you throw is a system where the municipality says that we don't want organic waste in the landfill. So you can no longer put organic waste in your garbage. You have to put it in a special bag that we sell you for a low cost and it's a biodegradable bag, and the tax that goes to that biodegradable, that you gain from that biodegradable bag is used to buy commercial composting that the city will do to compost all that waste. In this case, the heavy users pay more. What we do now mostly is your taxes cover, often cover waste disposal. So if you have your garbage picked up, that's part of the taxes that your municipality charges. Uh, if you pay for the tax, if you pay for your garbage disposal, that's a separate issue. Um, but the uh, if you have that where it's rolled into and you don't see it, the heavy users pay more if you have this commercial composting situation. And uh, if you, you save money, if you use less. The organic material gets recycled. You encourage and facilitate local gardening and things along those lines. But the important issue is that if you start having to pay to put your organic waste in a bag, you will see how much you're throwing out. And if you start recognizing that you're throwing out more than you think, which is probably the case, you will start economizing your food and being a little bit more cautious. So you end up saving money and resources. With time, hopefully the amount of organic waste that goes into the system will be less. The municipality saves money, you save money and the resources are reserved so everybody saves money and it's a beneficial thing. It'll end up costing less so that tax will be less than what the commercial city taxes are now, but it's obvious when you have to pay it as a tax and not obvious when you pay it as part of your municipal taxes. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, 
We have uh, food production is sufficient to feed everybody in the planet. The losses can be reduced by known and yet unknown means. And we have the resources around the globe to help with technology transfer in places where it's appropriate. The village food processing that Ali talked about is a way of taking food that would normally be wasted, giving it a longer shelf life and helping with economic development as well as food recovery. The regulatory system can be used to recover food. Uh, the food loss reduction can justify better infrastructure. And uh, we need to build a political will. And then waste can be reduced by improving the awareness and targeting action. So we have the collective knowledge to reduce hunger and reduce food losses. Uh, we need to do it. So last slide, please. And uh, I am open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ken. This was uh, really wonderful and uh, very, uh, very well complimenting uh, both presentation of uh, Alistair Hicks and uh, Charles Award. Uh, there are many questions, but uh, before I start with them, uh, I will repeat the question that I asked uh, Alistair before you started your presentation. Uh, I think that you answer uh, some of uh, you know this uh, in your concept of uh, how to minimize uh, the food waste especially in restaurants and this is actually what are the methodology to reduce food waste in restaurants and catering services i know that uh, probably will be good if we only be served a small portions at restaurants uh, and uh, probably uh, something else you can add to this and uh, all of you please uh, feel free to answer this question? I think the idea of restaurants having to have everything on the menu all the time is a uh, promotes waste because mm -hmm. if they sell those food products, they sell them. If they don't sell them, they become waste. So I think it's perfectly reasonable for restaurants to say that this is on the menu, but we ran out of this. Now, if they keep on running out of the same product, obviously they should increase the production of that. But I think that if an, an occasional running out of one of the items on the menu and not generating it as waste is preferable to always producing more than you need. Um, so that's one way. Uh, taking that waste and doing what they do in all France where they collect those restaurant waste and use those nutrients in the soil is another way of reducing the waste overall. Um, and the idea of allowing second and smaller portions, uh, the model with that is satiety, not gluttony. And uh, I, I think that the the United States deal where we have the supersize your meals is, uh, for lack of a nicer word, stupid. <laughs> it doesn't help us and it doesn't help the uh, of the economy and it leads to obesity and all kinds of things so i think it's a, a it's a silly thing but the restaurants are marketing on the basis of their generous portions which i think is a mistake yeah and probably also we uh, the consumers probably we need to demand shorter menus so basically <laughs> This will be and probably more engaging and more interesting for them. Every single time they go, they have different menu. What is, mm. you know, season and what uh, is not going to be with uh, longer mileage to be, you know, brought into their plates. Okay, uh, Charles and Ali, would you like to uh, add something to the answer that Ken gave us? Well, just, uh, just a. a, a uh, addition to that, a sort of variation on what uh, Ken has uh, talked about in, uh, very comprehensively, is the the uh, eat all you can type of restaurant which has emerged. Um, but you must eat everything on your plate. In other words, if you leave food on your plate, you will be charged more for leaving that food on the plate, and that actually has a very a profound effect on 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 people. Yeah. They try and either eat all they can or they don't take quite as much as they thought they needed or wanted. So that's just a variation and perhaps one that works. So I agree on it. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very good proposal. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, especially when you have um, uh, the buffets. And there are restaurants yeah. that do that. Yeah. They give you a plate, you can eat all that you want, but if you have anything left on the plate, they charge you more. Exactly. <laughs> 
Good idea. Charles, would you like to add something? <laughs> well, those are imaginative solutions, but have uh, been observed. It's not really a problem in my part of the world. Um, it, it, it is true that um, there are the affluence in, people, in places like Lagos, Abuja, who may go to restaurants, and at the end of the day, there is access to throw away, but um, it's really insignificant. What one would like to see is for such restaurants, because not far away from those affluent neighborhoods are people who need this food badly. So if such restaurants could, could just get them and get them to the poor nearby, it, it will help. But for us, it's not really a big problem. Yeah, this is actually a two sides of the coin. So in our part of the world, we are overindulging, uh, over consuming, and uh, this is uh, how we ended up with two billion people overweight or obese. And on the other part of the world, 820 million people are staying hungry, actually uh, very undernourished. The other questions uh, that I would like to ask you uh, for Alistair, the value addition you mentioned through solar, etc., is on a small scale. The farmers' losses of uh, harvested crop is the major setback uh, to him or her. What needs to be done in urgency as that the point he or she gets into distress, sale and losses? This is the question for you. Oh, that's uh, quite a complex question. And uh, in fact, Charles was, was giving some many pointers in that area in terms of dealing with um, good agricultural practices, good, uh, good processing practices and so on and uh, uh, but when you visit markets uh, for example in, in Mumbai you're, you're seeing produce that's falling out of the, the packaging that it's coming in in other words that even the cartons that are carrying the produce sometimes have got holes in them or a plank is missing and produce is falling out but at the same time they have uh, live animals uh, cattle in particular and sometimes goats and other animals and not so far away, which come and eat a lot of that green waste. So that you, you've then got basically what you uh, could say is fresh milk on the spot and available uh, to people uh, from the waste that is occurring uh, at the marketplace in particular. Now, in terms of the loss on the farm, I, I, I still think that in developing countries, most farmers will pick up every grain that they've, they've harvested. They won't. Uh, let many grains go yeah. astray, uh, and, and in fact, in, in some other countries, which perhaps uh, shall remain nameless, they still have the situation where people actually glean and, and are allowed to go through the, 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 the field and pick up grains that haven't been picked up. So I, I, mm -hmm. I, I doubt whether they lose as much as some of the farmers in the more developed countries who, who abandon tons of product simply yeah. because it's the wrong shape or size or maturity. Mm. And, and that is, is tragic because, um, quite frankly, that, that produce can be made available. And now the supermarkets are waking up to that fact and they're selling uh, produce which is uh, they call ugly produce or out of shape yeah. produce. Mm -hmm. And it's for a lesser price, but people are quite happy to, to buy it because it's, it's saving their money and especially in the present uh, situation where food prices are rising so rapidly, I think that that is a solution that needs to be explored and encouraged as much as possible. Uh, perhaps, perhaps Charles would, would like to add to that. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I want to I add think... something. So, oh, sorry. sorry, Charles, I just wanted to add uh, that probably you mentioned about uh, in Australia, we have the odd uh, bunch uh, of uh, fruit and vegetable that are sell in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other issues that uh, we have to sort them packaging, but uh, but otherwise the idea is very good. The ugly and unwanted, um, you know, produced to be uh, bought from by the consumers. OK, Charles, sorry, continue with what you wanted to add. No, I just wanted to say that um, Ali has um, dealt with the question uh, effectively. Um, one, one big challenge that we face, of course, um, uh, Ken talked about um, bumpy roads and all that, uh, but there are 
parts of the country where you, you there, are, there are just no roads at all. You cannot just get to the farm. And the, the fresh produce is just out there, at times not just harvested because there is just so much that they can deal with themselves. So, but so to get them out at all becomes a big problem. So even feeder, what we call feeder rules are at times not available in some of these uh, production centers. So the issue of infrastructure is really very, very important. But we must stress what Ali has had uh, that uh, good manufacturing practices, teaching these people to do the right thing. And invariably, they are always willing, uh, if you can truly make the case for them to do the right thing. But having done the right thing, to get the things out again could become a problem. I can add to that a little bit if you like. In, in, in one of the Himalayan countries, uh, the oranges were taking three days to get to the market, carried by the farmers on their backs. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we did was to uh, arrange for a processing facility to be halfway up the mountain so that they would walk only one day or so with the oranges and put them into that uh, small processing plant, uh, produce the juice, leave behind the waste and bring the juice to the market. And that was a lot a lot better on the, on the farmers who had to walk anyway, but they were walking with much more value added product on their backs rather than the, the whole uh, produce. It was just another suggestion anyway. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's a question for Charles. Uh, traditional practices and needs to be respected in food storage and silos are not the solution to all, as you know. We need silence, uh, sorry, we need science of storage to improve engineering site of small but affordable storage structures to the hosting methods of villages to help farmers. Uh, great question. It's a comment. I, I can't agree more. I think it's it's um, very, very valid. And um, at times, unfortunately, again, uh, Ken talked about um, technologies that are appropriate. Um, in Nigeria, we had an investment in huge silos that can take 20,000 tons of um, grain and huge facilities and as part of uh, our strategic grain reserves. But we are finding out that um, building those facilities is the easy part. Mm -hmm. Having to manage them and run them is the difficult part. Mm -hmm. So you fill them up with grains that you think will last, keep in storage for a year. If you don't follow the right techniques, do proper aeration, check the maze. At the end of the day, you find hundreds, thousands of tons of grains are lost. Mm -hmm. So really, I agree with you. Rather than building huge silos, what we need will be storage of grains that are properly dried in bags, in warehouses, things that the farmer can inspect and manage. So it's a very, very valid uh, point. We have traditional techniques and what we need to do, study them, bring about little uh, some improvements that will make them better instead of just introducing technologies that they cannot manage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, uh, you wanted to add something, Alison? Yeah? I, I could take that another step further, not with grain so much, but with fresh fruit. And again, uh, in another Asian country, the fresh fruit was spoiling by the time it reached the market because of the, the problem that Ken had mentioned, the, the, the bumpy roads and the lack of uh, uh, proper, proper transport. And they were uh, packed in ice, but it still didn't make it. So they, they, were, they were asking us to look into it. And we looked into it and we said, well, the best thing was to pre-cool the fruit. And in other words, have a hydro cooling arrangement uh, and, and then bring them to the market. And, and I was asked, well, why? Why don't we build a cold storage to, to store this fruit? I said, well, the obvious answer is it's got a very short short shelf life. So let's pre-cool it and bring it straight to the market. 
rather than store it and have uh, 70 percent losses uh, simply because it's gone off before it got to the market so there, there's another issue we don't even build the storage we just get it to the market as quickly as possible and sell it for consumption but that's on a, on a high spoilage, spoilage type of product ken probably can add uh, to that as well i think and i will have a question for ken too uh, oh, to include him uh, so can the prevention of food losses and waste uh, must be linked to food safety and quality at different stages but unsafe food uh, can be diluted with uh, a good quality food to overcome the regulations the way out is analytical techniques uh, based on biotech in the future opening of food safety what's your comment on such an approach to lead uh, the food regulations uh, worldwide based on science as always being mentioned well that's where the science really comes in because there are certain things that you can dilute <coughs> for instance you know, the insect parts that i mentioned earlier or things that give you a bellyache but you can dilute things like clostridium botulinum or salmonella and use that as a way to reduce the levels down um it does work for things like um oh, pesticides and uh you know things that are uncomfortable but not safety hazards so you have to be careful about which they are uh i i have a story that uh, i kind of enjoy that um there are people that say we want to ban um pesticides from uh, no, uh, antibiotics. We want to ban antibiotics from our food. And it turns out that there are microorganisms in the soil that create antibiotics to survive. And those are detectable in any food grown out of the soil and anything that eats any food that grows out of the soil. In other words, uh, you can detect these antibiotics in anything if you want to find it. So you have to be careful about what those standards are. That make any sense yeah uh, the example i like to give is back in 1954 when the food editors amendment came out in the united states the level of detection was a part per million now it's a part per trillion which is a part per million in a part per million so at a part per trillion you can find something and you say oh i don't want that anymore at a part per trillion you can find anything you want to find <laughs> so it gets yeah. to the point where it gets ridiculous yeah Many of our audience is congratulating all of you um, for uh, your talks and um, they comment that we need to ensure farmers is the most uh, benefited in the food chain and not the least. And uh, another comment as well. Um, and the presentations highlighted the essential aspects. It is important to educate everyone in this regard, from children to adults, uh, but also politicians, officials from local to regional administration. Naturally, we need uh, real policies. Um, and uh, it's cut here the question, so I can't continue. Probably is going to to continue in some stage, but this is uh, all. Um, natural we need real policies developed with adequate funding oh sorry this is the comment to the end okay i wanted to just ask uh, charles uh, because uh, he was showing uh, people climbing on the trees to collect uh, the harvest whatever um, things was uh, there to be collected so uh, climbing very high trees uh, is not so safe and can lead to other health problems, injuries, and any other. What techniques or technologies uh, should be introduced, uh, implemented uh, in this part of the world that are not having the technology in place to help them with that very, very uh, high technical task to climb these high trees? Well, the... Or tall trees. Well, cl yeah, well climbing can be well there are risks associated with it but perhaps you did not see what we have by the side of the tree is actually a ladder we all use ladder even just to reach out to the shelf or what have you so we are not saying that they should wrap their arms around the trunks of the tree and try to climb up the tree but they should use ladders 
and carry with them a picking bag. Um, but if they don't want to climb, um, they can use a very long pole at the end of which there is like a sickle. And that device does not show well, but um, Ali is an engineer and you can imagine what I'm talking about. You can design something with a sickle that just cuts, it's actually mangoes that you are harvesting, that cuts the mango at the base of the branch and the cut mangoes falls into that basket attached, basket-like attached to the sickle and you can just bring it down gently. So it, it can be done without uh, climbing the tree. It, it can be done, so we need not climb the tree. But, but the thing is, and, and this is the real catch, it takes some effort on the part of the farmer. So you really yeah. need to convince the farmer that there is a benefit in my taking that extra effort mm -hmm. instead of just shaking, taking that mango tree and shaking it and let all those ripe fruits fall to the ground. That would be yeah. the easiest way to, ha to harvest them. But to convince the farmer that what you need to do is to try to ha harvest each bunch carefully so that you do not damage. So that really is the, is, the, is the challenge. I agree with you, there could be risk, but it could be made uh, safer. Manageable. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Are there uh, innovative uh, ways to achieve post-harvest loss without chemicals, preservatives for local farmers? Uh, any of you can answer. Well, good planning is, is the key and uh, uh, planting programs where the crops are planted such that they are marketed after planting and after harvesting at the, the right uh, uh, maturity uh, is is a way of, of preventing losses, uh, and and the problem with farmers sometimes is that I think it's improving so much now with the information sharing and with the telephone uh, contacts as, as was mentioned. Uh, but um, if 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 the farmers come, fall into a me too attitude that oh my farm my my neighbour has made a lot of money growing that crop I'm going to grow a lot of that crop and uh, sell it uh, immediately the price drops to half and they wonder why. So it it uh, it really needs to be planned and carefully thought out to 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 just produce enough for the market. And uh, as as I've mentioned, I think the the consumers are the real drivers of the market, uh, not not the farmer. So the farmer needs to respond to the consumer demands, to the marketing demands, uh, in order to prevent losses, which are avoidable uh, with the more information that they get on, on the marketing aspect. So perhaps Charles would, would like to add to that. Yes, Charles. Well, I would just yes. Well, I would just stress the point about good um, hygienic practices, mm -hmm. especially yeah. from the standpoint of where I am coming from. Mm. If that is adhered to, uh, you can reduce the level of uh, inoculum, that is, the contaminating microorganisms, uh, considerably. Traditionally, again, there are things that we used to do before that we no longer do. Maybe they are no longer sustainable. We used to have what we call a shifting cultivation, where you walk a piece of land for some time, and then you leave it to follow and move along to another piece of land. Okay. So during that interval period, whatever is associated with that land in, in terms of contamination is no longer there, and you have a lesser risks. So there are some traditional practices that do reduce that. But of course, I'm sure my colleagues will agree with me that um, there are, of course, um, pesticides, chemicals that we can use that are safe. So we must continue to promote the use of those ones. Mm -hmm. Again, the, some of the biggest challenges that we face is with regards to education. Because when mm -hmm. you train these farmers and they use these pesticides when you don't train them and they work very well, they tend to use more than the recommended doses because they think the more they use, the greater the effect. So what they will now end up with will be residues that are beyond the level that is acceptable in international trade or the minimum Same permitted level. by law for that particular chemical. So this is where education comes in. 
So if we educate, educate them properly, that you can use these things, you can use them safely, there's a limit to which you can use, then the, the damage will be reduced, yeah, in terms of food safety. Yeah. There's also- There are two more questions. So, uh, you wanted to add something, sorry, yeah. One is, um, there are natural um, uh, remedies also, where you plant certain plants and they happen to either attract insects or, or not attract insects or things along mm -hmm. that lines where you get natural ways of handling some of these problems. John, John, John. Yeah. So there are two, two more questions that I wanted to ask you. Ken, you were talking about uh, post harvest uh, loss prevention uh, research institutes around uh, the globe. Mm -hmm. So how this uh, post harvest loss uh, research institute uh, can achieve uh, their mandate to develop a needed storage and processing technologies and obviously help not only their countries but uh, the other countries in need as well i found out that these institutes exist all over the world uh, many of them and a lot of them don't have their budgets are limited to the point where they don't go to international conferences and don't publish in English, they publish in their local language, like the Sigalese that I mentioned. Uh, yeah. The Institute of Post Harvest Technology in Sri Lanka had 35 projects, and they were fantastic projects, but they're only known in the country because they didn't have any mandate to pass this on. So um, these the countries can't afford the losses. Hmm. The developed countries can afford the losses. They, uh, you know, like Alistair mentioned, that the prices can go uh, down if you have too much. So, so they don't mind losses in some senses. The developing uh, countries can't afford those losses, so they have worked to get rid of them, but they've done it locally. Hmm. So they exist, but they're just not known outside. I was in the field for thirty years before I found the first one. <laughs> yeah. And then I found Another many question. after that. Yeah. Another question. Due to pesticides uh, residues, uh, the world is standing into the usage of more bio-based pesticides. Uh, what are you uh, all thinking uh, and uh, probably doing to collaborate with research institute in exploring workable solutions developed? This is another question from our audience. Well, well, there are. Uh, Charles will start. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, there are, uh, as um, I think uh, Ken was uh, mentioning, um, there are uh, a lot of um, uh, plants uh, that we know, like the extract from the neem tree, that we know that have uh, insecticidal properties. And there are other local plants that we know that have um, antimicrobial uh, properties. So um, there's a lot of research um, going on in um, using uh, these plants. And some of them are used uh, as they are, but the real breakthroughs will come with um, identifying the active uh, compounds in those plants, ex, uh, extracting them, and then uh, providing them on a commercial and large scale. So that is where we are facing really uh, challenges, okay? So it's a question of uh, scaling up technology, again, resources. Um, but unfortunately, again, we complain that we don't have resources, but as um, Ken pointed out, if we had the power to influence the political will, uh, mm -hmm. and we can only divert our resources to such things, then we'll make a better progress. Unfortunately, scientists are often not in such a position. So uh, I agree there are many of these that really, if we exploit uh, these biological sources, then we can solve a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can aim uh, all the scientists to reunite together so something could move forward. Sure, Who knows? Sure. Anyone wants to add something? If uh, yeah, not, I will I, ask you the last, uh, yeah? Ken? I, I, I mentioned GMOs are, uh, earlier and I have very mixed feelings about uh, GMOs, you know, uh, genetically yeah. modified organisms. Yeah. 
some of what they so do. So many consumers around the world has mixed yeah. feelings about GMO as well. What Charles mentioned is you find an active com uh, component in something that works as a pesticide or an antimicrobial or something along those lines. They can take that gene, plug it into another plant, and they make so they've made certain crops that used to be destroyed by something uh, much more resistant. That's good. Then you get the same company that makes that product sterile, so you have to buy seeds from that company, which I think is criminal. So uh, <laughs> I have mixed feelings about it. But uh, the technology itself, if you have, um, it's not different than what we used to do. What we used to do is we would grow different crops, and if one was more resistant, we would take that one and promote it. So we were doing genetic modification by selective breeding what GMO is doing it is much more effective in the sense that they can find the specific gene that they want to promote. So uh, I would love to see it done from the scientific standpoint that is good for us and get rid of those practices which are strictly for the economic advantage of the company. Yeah, maybe a comment to this. So what you add is a comment from our audience. Sometimes the abnormal use of synthetic chemicals uh, is uh, as a result of uh, the enormous information giving to farmers who can't actually read by sellers. Some chemical sellers, especially at the end of uh, the retailer, do not understand the use of some chemicals and as such do not know how to give proper directives uh, to farmers who don't know how it's just a contribution. So uh, this is uh, complementing what you said. And our, uh, anyone wants to add something to this? Or for me, I will ask uh, your last question uh, for all of you. Are there any grant or loan structures to promote development of facilities to reduce post-harvest losses people can access? This is uh, my last question. Obviously not. Charles mentioned that there are no resources. <laughs> but how people, from where to start? Probably they can join a global harmonization post harvest uh, reduction group, which you can. This is probably a, a good start. Sure. Yeah. And, and I can see there is uh, uh, more comments coming, uh, but uh, I think that we. Oops, done uh, our webinar over time so i will wrap it up okay thank, thank you, you very much, much uh, for yeah. your lovely sorry you wanted to add something sorry no, yeah you can add. To say thank you thank you very much diane <laughs> i wish to say thank you as well okay so i wanted thank to you. thank you three of you uh thank you uh, dr charles uh Award, uh, Dr. Alistair Hicks and Dr. Kenneth Marsh for the lovely presentation and uh, very, very engaging talk that we had after the presentations. Um, I, I'm sure that our audience uh, uh, appreciate the knowledge that they built uh, from this webinar. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gerhard Schlenning and uh, Dr. Nicola Stanley for your help with making this uh, webinar possible. All of you, don't forget to jump into the GHI Congress website. Uh, you can see it display at uh, the chat. Uh, it's www.ghiworldcongress.org. And please surprise us with your abstract proposals. The Congress Scientific Committee is uh, looking forward to reading and assessing your abstract. And we would love to hear all of your presentation during our Congress next year march 18 to 20 march in rotterdam in the netherlands thanks again for all of you our audience being part of our reducing post-harvest food loss and wastage journey thank you for being with us today and see you next time stay safe healthy and be curious uh, keep smiling and enjoy your beautiful life <laughs> bye bye bye, -bye. Yeah. <laughs>